about the 22nd prophecy about the cross in the 22nd Psalm, Jesus equates himself with a worm, rather a grub. It says, behold, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. This passage was repeated in the gospels as people mocked Jesus on the cross and he took it voluntarily. About this particular worm that we're mentioning, it's the word tola in Hebrew. Henry Morris writes this, when the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. Sounds like the cross to me. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. As the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. From the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives us of Christ dying on the tree, shedding his precious blood that he might bring many sons unto glory. He died for us that we might live through him. In one way or another, everything pictures him in the Bible, even a worm. It's all about him. Everything points to the majesty of a bruised and crushed Savior, a glorious servant. Now, rather than trying to expand any further on what God has given us concerning his suffering servanthood, allow me the honor, please, of simply reading to you the prophesied role of this suffering servant from the book of Isaiah. It's a little bit long. Close your eyes and think about what Christ Jesus did for you as he went through his life and his crucifixion. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was, appearance was so disfigured that beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were told, what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet he was considered stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb. Once again, the word amnas, the sacrificial lamb, a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering and a sham, going back again to the sacrifices of the Old Testament, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so Jesus suffered and he died, just as Isaiah prophesied, in every detail. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Have 
you seen the passion of the Christ? If you think that was overkill, it wasn't. It very well may not have told the extent of Jesus Christ's suffering. So I ask you again, would you do this for a cockroach? And before you answer, let me add in that a cockroach does not curse his creator. Jesus Christ confirmed his role as the one to suffer as he walked along the road to Emmaus with two people that didn't recognize him. He said, then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the things in the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Everything's about Jesus. But in contrast, Peter spoke of the reason for Christ's suffering. It was all for us. For Christ suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. For me, a cockroach is closer to me than I am to God. And for me, he did this. And Jesus didn't just suffer physically. He also suffered in agony as he waited his cross. He suffered and mourned with those who mourned, and he suffered temptation, just as we did. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for that in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. For me, unbelievable. I can't get over it ten years later. And for you, for each one of you, he did this. But suffering is not the end of the story. There is something more amazing ahead. And that brings me to point number four, the resurrection of Christ. Henry Morris said, and please listen carefully as I read this quote, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. Now, I want you to know before I talk about this that the resurrection is the most documented occurrence in ancient history. It is absolutely sure. There is nothing more sure in all of the texts of the world than the resurrection of Jesus Christ from that time period. Now, after including this quote in this sermon, I thought about it, and I thought about it a lot. I had all the information to agree with the conclusions about it, and I've taught on every precept as to why this conclusion must be true. But I still never really mentally aligned it up until a couple weeks ago. Early in the morning, I was out cleaning the parking lot at Davidson's Drugs with my leaf blower, and I was coming around the back corner of Davidson's Drugs, and it all came into focus. Yes, I believe in the resurrection, but how does that prove that Jesus is God? How does it do it? That's what I was thinking as I was trying to determine in my mind before I went quoting something that I just couldn't logically agree with 100%. But I was blowing off a pile of sand and glass. Somebody took a bottle and they threw it up against the wall. It was full of beach sand. And I was blowing it off. And as the sand went away from the glass, my mind cleared up just like the glass did with the sand disappearing. The, re the resurrection is a result of a sinless life. We all know that. It's the only way it could have happened. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. That's recorded in Genesis, and then it's explicitly said in the book of Romans. We die because of sin. Jesus lived a sinless life. So what? This doesn't prove Jesus is God. What if somebody was born today, and he didn't sin in his whole life? Would this prove the, that he is God? No. Could he die and receive the resurrection? No, because babies die all the time and they've never committed a sin. And they're not God and they don't resurrect. So I'm thinking, what am I missing here? The very precepts that I've taught in the past, in classes and even here giving sermons, are what prove this precept. I just needed to line them up with this guy's quote. Not only did Jesus live a sinless life, but he was born sinless. He was born of Mary, not of man. Those dead babies, they were born of Adam. They inherited man's sin. All right? Sin transfers through the man. This means that Jesus was born of God and Mary. 
So the resurrection is 100% conditional on the virgin birth. No virgin birth equals no resurrection. But the virgin birth does not guarantee the resurrection. Nor does living a sinless life, even if one is born, not born of a virgin. Both the virgin birth and a sinless life are conditions for the resurrection. If Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then he would have inherited Adam's sin. But even if he was born of a virgin, he would still need to live perfectly, sinlessly throughout his life in order to receive this resurrection. So I wrote up two arguments so you can understand this. The resurrection is conditional upon a sinless life. A sinless life is conditional on the virgin birth. Therefore, the resurrection proves the virgin birth. And then the second argument. The resurrection proves the virgin birth. The virgin birth proves that Jesus was born of God and Mary. Therefore, Jesus is God's son, the God-man. I like to say, I've known that all along, but it's just nice to have that cleared up in my head before I go quoting something. But now that we have that out of the way, I want to give you one more thought on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here it comes. I copied it from Mark 16, verse 6. He is risen. But even that isn't the end of the story. There's still more before we finish. This is my fifth point. The King of Glory. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of Glory. Daniel Webster said this, If I might comprehend Jesus Christ, I could not believe on him. He would be no greater than myself. Such is my consciousness of sin and inability that I must have a superhuman Savior. So after his resurrection, Jesus stayed with the apostle for 40 days. And imagine the things that they learned in those 40 days. They went from being complete novices about the things of God to the heralds of a new plan in God's redemptive order. If you've never taken the time to read the epistles, the epistles are the letters from Romans to Jude. It literally takes a couple of hours. But there is more information in those letters about the things of God than in every book ever published in human history in a few hours of reading. We have in those books the great unveiling of God's unimaginable plan for the people of the world right there at our fingertips. And instead, we play the week till all hours of the night. Make it a commitment to read those books because you can do it in less time than it takes you to brush your teeth over the period of a month, if you brush your teeth. Please brush your teeth. <laughs> Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Christ's ascension and in his present session, he dwells in the same physical body that he lived and died in. So the question is, where is he now? And the only reasonable explanation is that he has moved into some other dimension in this time-space world. He's hidden from our view, but he is there working out his many roles on our behalf for the church, the people that he loves. Wherever Enoch and Elijah are, wherever they went, that's my guess is where he is. And he really will return again into the stream of humanity at some point. That's recorded several times in the New Testament, in Corinthians and in Thessalonians and especially in the book of Revelation. But until that time, he is actively interceding on our behalf between God the Father and us. He's fulfilling his role as our advocate and as our mediator. John calls him an advocate. He says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The very fact that John brings in the fact that we need an advocate proves that he knows that sin will come. No one needs an advocate unless they have been charged with an offense. In the book of Hebrews, though, he is called our mediator. So what's the difference? An advocate is a person who pleads for or on behalf of another. A mediator is a person who intervenes to bring about an agreement.